The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. church planner this is pete mitchell and this is peyton jones and uh you are i almost wanted to go through the same thing i went through last week where i'm like you are lucky enough blessed enough from no don't do it to the church planner podcast just because god doesn't strike you once for saying that doesn't mean i think you'll get away with it twice that's true that's true so uh anyway peyton why don't you uh introduce our guest and then we'll we'll get going i was actually thinking i owe you a hug so i just want you to know i'm looking forward to that hey i am hugless douglas over here i i i'm i'm feeling the lack of love uh, pete promised me a hug if you are listening to this podcast for for any length of time you know that it takes covid19 lockdown and the government asking us not to hug to get pete mitchell to just be dying to give me a hug uh, Pete, Pete does not like to hug. Pete does not give hugs. Pete doesn't like to touch anyone for any reason except his kids and his wife. And that's it. So it's true. And that's why I got a big hug waiting for you. Pete's theory about the end times is he's not sure what country the Antichrist may come from, but he's pretty sure they're going to be masquerading as a greeter at a local church near you. That could be. Actually, <laughs> I was thinking, uh, I'm pretty sure he's coming from California. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. So, hey, I'm hearing things. I'm, I don't know if I, I don't know. Do you what are you that? hearing? Siri's popping off. There you go, talking about the Antichrist, and Siri starts talking. Oh, you know what? It could be. What if the Antichrist was AI, huh? <laughs> okay, so now I have to introduce my guest after this. After that. I'm just telling him, hey, we're a legit podcast, not like Ed Stetz, where he's like, what are you guys, two guys knocking back beers in mom's basement? But for real, uh, we'll introduce my guest now, who's now thinking, what in the heck have I walked into? My guest is author Jerome Daly, who has written a book called Gravitas. And the book really is, it, it's an appeal to recover um, something that's been lost, really. And, and, and I'm not going to unpack it any more than that. I read the book. I actually read the book, enjoyed the book, um, but I'm going to introduce Jerome into this conversation. I, I warned him. We mess around a bit at first, but uh, so there's no gravitas at all in the beginning of this. But uh, Jerome, welcome onto the podcast, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me here. Join the carnival. <laughs> well, you know our 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 audience are not. We we always have to tell people our audience are not pastors. They are church planters. These are guys that are bivocational. They're working with their hands. They are surrounded by non-believers just probably most of the time. So this to them is tame, but it also reminds them they're not going nuts and uh, God still uses knuckleheads. And if we can get that across, that'll be all right. True that. Well, looking forward to the conversation. Well, before we jump into the book a little bit, just to waste just a little bit more of Jerome's time before we get going here, here's, I got the best insult this week, Pete. I was on a webinar with Daniel Yang, who's over at the uh, Wheaton Center and the uh, Billy Graham. we got him on the cover, didn't we, of the magazine? We probably did. And if we didn't, we should. That dude's legit. He is awesome. I actually want to write a book with him and Briscoe coming up. I've already been putting my feelers out. Let's write a book. So here's the deal. Um, Daniel, he came onto this webinar and his first comment was, Peyton Jones, it is very rare that you find the combination of someone who has both the voice and the face for podcasting. What the, that was the best insult. You didn't see it coming. It just came. Like a white hot light. You're, you're speechless. Were you expecting a little bit more reaction out of me? Because it took me a little bit too long to process that in my head. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. I, I, I didn't realize it took me about 
maybe two seconds to realize I just got burned. Didn't we have a meeting with him one time at Exponential? No, 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 no. That was that was that. No, that was someone else. I know who that was. Never mind. <laughs> no, it wasn't him. I know who you're. Yeah, yes. right, right. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, names were similar, but not quite. Right. Yeah. Well, hey. So, should we kick straight in with Jerome? Please do. Since right. I have absolutely no idea what we're talking about, I didn't <laughs> read the book. Please. Hey, I told you. I was like, hey, we got this guy. He's coming on. He's got a book. <laughs> Anyways, hey, so uh, Pete, you have a question you like to ask our guest before we begin. I do, actually. I, I always have one guest and a, or, or one question that I get to ask the guest, and it doesn't matter if I've read their book or not. Here's the question. <clears throat> and then we have a question at the end, which we used to do on Hardcore Church Planning, but we're doing it again. Baby. Yeah, let's do it. Especially after I know what this topic is. Uh, so anyway, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the question I got for you. Tell us your story of how you came to faith. Okay. Uh, well, I grew up as a pastor's kid in uh, Southeast North Carolina. And you had uh, me at, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I can relate to that. Yes. And, and so we can all join pastor's kids anonymous. Uh, it, you know, dad was a former military and as they say, never got the military out of the guy. Uh, but he was he was a church planter, um, called himself a serial church planter, and so he I think he went planted five or six over the course, and uh, so that yeah that's the life that I grew up in, and so I can never really remember a time when God wasn't pretty central in my life. It was kind of one of those anticlimactic comings to faith. I did have a couple of key moments in my journey though. Um, the first, both of these just kind of staggered right about the time I was 13. And, uh, so one of them came where I was invited to spend the night with a couple of, couple of, uh, school friends that were really not following Christ at all, even though we were all in a Christian school. And, and I started to feel for the first time in my young life, you know, a real pull, a real, I could really see a fork in the road ahead of me. Like, I can, I can kind of keep on this Godward course, or I can really try some hardcore evil, like smoking a cigarette or trying the parents' whiskey. And so, man, I fell hard, and I did try the whiskey, and I did try the cigarette. Um, but something really profound happened. I, I, remember, I remember trying to go to sleep in the wee hours of the morning and just thinking, are we having fun yet? because this doesn't really feel like fun. And man, if I had the guts, I would just call dad and have him come pick me up and take me home because this kind of sucks. And, but I didn't because that would have been really uncool. And I just gutted it out till morning. And when dad came and picked me up the next morning, got in the car and I'm sure he said, you know, so how was it? And I'm sure I said, fine. Um, but then he said something I'll never forget. He said, I woke up in the middle of the night last night. And it was kind of like I could hear you calling me. And, whew, dude, I was just undone. Hmm. I mean, I was undone. And, um, I mean, and it had nothing to do with, with Dad. It had everything to do with feeling like God was there. <laughs> God, God showed up. God, was, God cared about yeah. my little 13-year-old trauma and, mm -hmm. and just wanted me to know you know, that he was there. That's rad. And man, that's, that, that set me on a course for life. And I knew it at that time, like this will be my life now. So that was pretty cool. That's cool, Jerome. That's really cool. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. I, I love the fact that you're, you're familiar, but you know, your dad was probably in a breed of church planner that on this show we respect because church planning wasn't cool back then. Right. Like, right. so your dad was a hipster. He's like, Hey, I did this before it was cool. You know, same with Pete's dad. Pete's dad was bivocational. Pete's dad was also a, a, a church planner pastor. And you know, uh, those guys, man, they made a choice. They were just like, Hey, I'm probably not never going to make money at this thing that it's never going to pay my, my, my full way. 
And uh, that's not why I'm doing it. So for us, you know, on this show, man, when we start, you know, meeting like some of the guys that are old school or someone says my dad or my parents did this. It's big respect, man, because we're like, dude, that was back in the day where nobody was writing about it. It, it. it didn't have the attention it has now. It didn't have the support. It didn't have the training. It was just you had faith and the Holy Spirit and a Bible, and you just went for it. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I would oh, second that. I think, Dad, yeah, uh, he really did sort of embody that, um, you know, just I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this thing whatever it looks like, whatever it means. There, there, there were no consultants, as you say, no books. It's just kind of like, we're going to figure this thing out the hard way. you got to have a certain mental toughness for that as yeah. well as a, a call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you really do. I mean, it's so funny you say that. Um, the, uh, the, the kind of cool thing though, is just hearing your story that, you know, God, uh, you know, I'll tell you as a church planner, I got, I got two kids sitting over here watching the Disney movie. And there's nothing that would mean more to me. Like all my church plants, that's been great, but nothing would have meant more to him than his boy coming to faith. And that, that's just, that's beautiful, man. So, yeah. um, very cool. So, Hey, let's get into the book Gravitas. The, the book is, uh, Gravitas, the monastic rhythms of healthy leadership. And, um, all of those, man, that's that's firing on a couple different cylinders. That's a great subtitle. The monastic rhythm. So think about rhythms and then healthy leadership. Um, I love the story that you start off with um, in the very beginning where you kind of encounter gravitas in an individual. Can you tell us that story just to set up what gravitas is? It's not a word that we hear very often. Tell us about when you came across that and how it affected you. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Pete, what, what was that? I'm already choking him up. I haven't even told the story. Sorry, sorry. That was it, it was beautifully set up, and then you, you Mitchell, had, you had me at I was a pastor's kid. Sorry, <laughs> that was great. We're coming up to episode 400, and that one just that that has to live as a moment. You, you would think that after almost 400 episodes, we would have at least figured out how to podcast properly. But no, we still have it. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> what was great is, is Jerome's face was like all big on my, my Zoom. If you're listening to podcasts, that was funny. Pete, Pete did something. I don't know. He had, he had a, uh, a... I had some go down the wrong pipe, man. All of a sudden, I was like, I'm choking. I'm choking. It was a vocal malfunction. And... and his, it, it wasn't just that it happened. It was that his picture just came up on the Zoom super big while he's choking. So it was, sorry, that was a funny moment. But Jerome, we're just butchering. You're, we're trying to get into gravitas. We're trying to get serious, and it's just not happening, man. Yeah, you're, so you're, you're throwing my vibe all off, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is the world of church planning, though. And and guys, I'll tell you, um, this is a rad story. So, um, and I think. After listening to us knuckleheads, this is going to make a lot more sense what he's about to say. So, Jerome, take it, brother. Well, it's a really simple story. Uh, so I had, um, and I'll just interject, I, I've had my own stint as a pastor. Um, that was some years ago now, and I was attending a, a church that that we were at in High Point, North Carolina. And, and a, a, a visiting pastor came, not pastor so much as a uh, author, retreat leader, kind of a guy. Um, some of you would know his name, but so many of you wouldn't. He's, he kind of flies under the radar. He's, uh, um, and, and I'm, I'm not going to use his name, but he, he began to share some things about uh, God's heart for us. Uh, the, the just the visceral love that God carries for us. And you know, so he, it was a conference, so he was talking, you know, for, for hours, uh, interspersed by little breaks. And he's just a very soft-spoken, low-key kind of guy. Never gets animated, um, almost monotone. Uh, but the, the guy carries a presence. And, and I just found myself wrapped with attention, really not even so much with the words that came out of his mouth, but just that sense of sort of sitting at the feet of Jesus, not him, but, but like 
he was transparent. And it was just like, God's here. God's in the house. And I don't want to leave. It, and it was just so uh, opposite of the kind of thing that we think of as, as sort of charismatic and engaging and, and powerful. It was, it was just kind of all turned on its head. But the impact on me was there's weight on this guy. And, and the words that come out of his mouth feel like they've been earned and not just sort of crafted. Um, and, it, you know, it struck me. It stayed with me for, for years. And I didn't have the word gravitas to attach to it at the time. But later, as I was working on this book and thinking about the whole point of monastic rhythms, of, of making us into men and women who, who are not seeking to be impressive, but who do carry an aroma of Christ, you know, and that the things that we say and the things that we do would just have substance and not just be fluff. <laughs> and so this guy just kind of nailed it for me. And I, it just felt like a good way to try to cast a vision for what would it be like to show up in my life having, you know, sort of the, is the Sanhedrin, I think, that said over... Peter and Paul, I believe, you know, they, these guys are talking with authority and they just noticed that they had been with Jesus. It's like, ah, connection <laughs> yeah. been with Jesus. That's and awesome. you guys know just how easy it is to get detached from our intimacy with Christ, especially when, when we're working two jobs and trying to raise a family and there's just not enough of us seemingly to go around. And so anyway, that's a, a lead in. That's great, man. And, you know, I, I love that you draw the connection between the apostles who had authority and then Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. It says people were struck, kind of like you were. You know, it says that they, they were in awe and said, this man speaks with authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees. Yes. So there, there's that weight that affected you. And I think, you know, we recognize this. We, we recognize it. It, it would... It's what the Reformed uh, camp would have called back in the day. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones would, would have called it authority. You know, um, he has a book called Authority. And it, it, you know, it's like a train whistle, actually. <laughs> I have to, I. We, we have a train. Well, I should say Peyton has a train that, that visits us. It's kind of like the Avengers when you're watching that and he goes, and we have a Hulk. It's like, and we have a train. So that comes at, at times we can't control. It's like the whole kit does what's want. There's no stopping it. But it's your trademark. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like Mr. Rogers. He had a trolley. We got a train. But you know, the the thing is, is that the 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 authority um that you see, we recognize it in certain preachers and certain teachers. And it's interesting because Lloyd Jones didn't tell jokes. He didn't. I mean, he had it. You know, it was something that and it came from the Holy Spirit. That guy would just say, over and over and over, like what you're saying, he was kind of like a student of revival. He wanted the the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can't manufacture that. And yeah. it doesn't mean like kind of like we, you and I were joking around at the beginning. It doesn't mean that you're before the interview, we were we were telling you, hey, we screw around a bit. And you're like, oh, I hope I don't give the impression that, you know, like it's always serious. Like, I think the point of that gravitas and that authority is what you're saying. It's a spiritual weight. It doesn't, it, it's not to do with your temperament. It's not to do with your personality. It's something deeper, right? That works through your personality and through your temperament. Um, how, how did you connect gravitas with um, the monastic rhythms? What's the connection there? Well, it's, so it's been a, probably a decade since the, the monastic rhythm, rhythms have really shown up uh, on my radar have became fascinating to me. I began to, to feel that the devotional rhythms that I have had since literally I could read had brought me to this point, um, but that they were, not to put them down, but they're a bit of a drop in the bucket of, of, the, of the history of, of ancient devotion that's been ex expressed and walked out by so, you know, countless men and women of faith over the years. And, and I was looking for a word picture to kind of describe what, what would this 
what should this do for us? <laughs> if, if we're going to kind of dabble, as it were, in the monastic rhythms, I mean, why? And so the, the classic example of the tree came to mind, you know, roots, go, branches go up, roots go down. You've got what's seen, you've got what's unseen. And I feel like particularly as, as Christian leaders, oftentimes there can be so much pressure either externally or internally uh, to just, you know, push those branches up and p- squeeze out some fruit. And, and so the unseen, the hidden part is, is of course, what anchors that tree. And, and so you, we don't have to look far to see a lot of capsized leaders. And, 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 and there, there have probably been times in all of our journey where we've capsized, at least temporarily, because the extension of our gift or the extension of our influence exceeded the, the depth and grip of our our rootedness in God. And I think it's telling that Jesus talked periodically about going into the secret place, closing your door, praying in secret to the one who hears in secret. There's this whole, and and, you know, and Jesus played the secret card in his own journey for for quite a while. There seems to be this counter something, counterculturally, but counter intuitive move to go down instead of up that is woven into the kingdom. And uh, there's just a hunger in my heart to to be one of those guys. I mean, I I struggle with wanting to be seen, to wanting to be recognized or appreciated. Um, But but I have a real sober sobriety around that. Um, You know, I I I want the roots to, to be drawing up the life of God. And so that picture sort of led me to, to the idea of gravitas, the word gravitas. I'm not exactly sure how the word itself showed up on my radar, but it's like, yeah, I think there's something there. And it's not about being all sad or, or overly yeah. serious like we've been talking about, but there's, it's, it's about carrying substance, carrying weight. You've used the word authority and I use the word in the book. And even though that word can, have a little bit of baggage around it. It it does speak to something true and, and important in the journey. Yeah, you, you and you made the statement in the very beginning where you say, you know, it, it, something to the effect of, you know, you may not know completely how to define it, but you know it when you see it. And I really, I, I resonated with that. You do, you know, when you see it, and it and it doesn't have to be someone who is a leader. Like you could be in a in a small group. And it's just some guy that's like, maybe he's a furniture salesman and he's just sitting there and that dude has a deep walk with God. They might be quiet. They might be loud. But when they say it, like, as I, I've seen it in both cases, I've seen it when someone exercises the gift of prophecy, they don't even have to know they're exercising, it, but God's heart. I remember being in a, in a uh, leaders meeting once and our leaders meeting were team and we had, um, Deacons and elders were all meeting together and we were debating whether or not to go back to this place called Bixby Park, um, where we would do like opener evangelism, and barbecues, and that's that's where we would have our Sunday. So those of you listening in a, in a post-COVID-19 world uh, about to be, everybody's telling you, oh, you know, this is how you open your church. Or, you know, six, just go outside, man. Like, do do open air church, man. That's that's. That's the easiest solution to all this, but that's what we did um, back before this. And we were kind of, you know, we felt like there was some some work unfinished, but it was it was problematic. And this guy just he just opened his mouth, um, you know. He and he he wouldn't be a quiet guy at all. But when he said this one thing, it was just a couple sentences. There was that gravitas. There was that weight, and it stopped the room. And everybody just sat there going, huh. And, and he, I think he had given like a couple sentences. The second one was like a rhetorical question. Everybody just sat there and it was like, after 40 minutes of debating, it was done. Okay. That was the answer right there with one word. And it was that gravitas. And we had heard the heart of God. We had heard God's voice. So um, what, is, what are some of the um, things that, that people can do to cultivate? gravitas in their own life? Well, it, it, it begins, I would say, kind of conceptually with 
what I would call the first spiritual practice, which is the practice of paying attention in our lives. So maybe that sounds a little self-evident or, or a little trite, but really every spiritual practice that I can think of is just another form of really being attentive to the unseen. And, in, and until we can cultivate that in our lives, uh, what we would consider to be spiritual practice are just sort of activities. But if we can cultivate that sense of wanting to tune our ears to the voice of the spirit, uh, wanting to pay attention to how God is moving in and through us, paying attention to our own gift and our own shadow and understanding how those, you know, play tag with one another. Uh, this, this gift of having eyes to see, ears to hear, you know, that to me is the real essence of spiritual practice and the spiritual life and the beginning of putting roots down into something beyond just creeds and belief as vital as those can be. But as far as really walking with God, that, that's where the rubber meets the road. So, and, and moving from kind of that conceptual basis of monastic practice to just carving out time, you know, our most precious of commodities. So time plus attention <laughs> gives us the ability to really build a life in the secret place. It gives us the capacity to, to see those roots go down and to begin to um, really bring us into branch and divine really abiding with Christ. That's good, man. So somebody's listening to this today and they're, they're going, you know, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm not happy with my uh, time with Jesus. You know, you mentioned paying attention. I think that's really vital. Um, but somebody says, you know, I, I, I read the Bible. I pray. I, I do these things, but I, I, I kind of relate to what you're saying about, I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like I'm, I'm, it's my, my times of God aren't deep. I don't feel, I, I feel like they're surfacy. I, I want to grow deeper. I want to have deep communion with God. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they do? How do they get there? Sure. So when I talk about pushing out some time in our lives for God, uh, most of us immediately go to the idea of having our daily devotional, you know, our, our quiet time in, in the morning. And that is just our lifeblood. Um, but there are certain things that are hard to cultivate in the course of a contained amount of time that takes a certain spaciousness of time and a spaciousness of being particularly when our, our, our daily times with God can, don't have to, but can feel like, okay, I'm sort of getting the tank filled up so I can go into the day and spend it. Uh, which is, there is a truth in that, but it also feels a little bit transactional rather than just cultivating my affection and intimacy of just being with God because my soul longs to be with God and God's soul longs to be with me. Now we all go through times that feel really dry and, and dusty. Uh, I'm reading the old classic right now um, that everybody knows, but nobody's actually read <laughs> the dark night of the soul with uh, St. John of the cross. I know it and I have not read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hadn't until, just now. Is it good? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, quick quick answer. I'm reading a translation by a lady named Marabi Starr, and her her setup, her introduction is just powerful, mind blowing. When you get into the actual reading of John, even with her translation uh, of the original Spanish and kind of softening off some of the kind of archaic edges. It still reads awkward. Um, and if you read any of the old mystics like Teresa of Avila and uh, the author of The Cloud of Unknowing and, and some of these, you know, 
mystical tomes from the past. There's, there's I'm actually little... reading a book about St. Ignatius of Loyola called What Do You Really Want? Now, right. it's not the original work, but it's it's doing exactly it's. Hey, let me help you. Let me just take this stuff from the, his his work, not make you grind all the way through it. Let me put it in a, a kind of modern, convenient way with some conclusions. Here right. you go. Eat this. Yeah. So there's some things that in our modern minds we kind of stumble over when we when we read the languaging and the ethos that they carried, you know, whatever seven centuries ago. Um, but it's so you kind of have to weed through some of that and and go. Wow. Boy, the insights here were revolutionary, and and not only were revolutionary in the day, the 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 core messages here is revolutionary just in a timeless way, and and nobody's really talking this way anymore. So I want to pay attention. <laughs> so, yeah, little. Yeah, uh, I, I I think that that I'm I'm kind of like you. I I, I love the links to the ancient to me, I, this is a way I distill principles, um, particularly in church planning. Um, to me, it has to be something I see in scripture. It has to be something that I've seen in church history and it has to be something that works. Um, now on one hand you'd be like, well, that sounds a little bit like it should just be in scripture, but my interpretation of scripture is what's suspect. Like, I don't always trust how Peyton Jones interprets scripture. I mean, if I told you some of the crazy views I used to have, you know, because of maybe the camp I came out of, or, you know, maybe so-and-so was like, Hey, the Pope's antichrist or, you know, whatever it is. Don't, don't get Peyton talking about the Nephilim. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I have very sane theological views, very grounded, but here's the deal. You can't call something a principle if it doesn't actually work, yeah. if it's not in scripture, and if, it, if both of those things are true, then surely if it is a principle, it's not the first time it's shown up in church history. Right. So I'm rooted to that ancientness in a sense. I tend to think any principle is going to be timeless, and it's going to be... Um, it's going to supersede culture, right? It's going to be something that any person at any place at any time can relate to. And I think our spirituality is that. And so when I saw this book, like I get drum, I get sent a lot of books. I don't read all every book I'm sent. But when I saw that, I'm like, you know, I don't, this is the second book I read recently on monastic rhythms. Hmm. And the other guy that I read, he was, <laughs> now this is bad, but he was really taken with monasticism. Um, and, uh, and it was, I think it was like business principles taken from that. But I kept wondering the whole book, well, how come you're not a monk then? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> he was so like, this is the way, man. But I, I felt like your book was very sensible, very balanced. You're not, you're not like, like the old thing about the guy going, this guy's the greatest. The guy wheelbarrowing across Niagara Falls and the guy looks down. Why don't you get in then? I felt like the other book, like the guy wouldn't get in it. Like, stop telling me how great the wheelbarrow on the, on the trapeze wire is. I felt with you, it was, Hey, I'm pulling these principles. I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not glorifying monasticism. I'm, I'm just finding these guys were onto something and I can apply this in my life. I can apply this in my walk of life today. And that was helpful. So what are some practical things, Jerome, that, um, you know, our readers can take away? And, and this is the part in which you entice them with a snippet to get them to buy your book. That's like a little pro tool there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. that <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little pro tip. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I can get you just a, hopefully you're already getting a bit of a flavor uh, of what this is about. Let me give you a sneak peek at an overview on the content. So what, where I'm trying to tap into some of the, the learnings and experiences of generations of monastic life that have been vested in a life of, of gravitas, if we, if we could frame it that way. Um, and there, and there are many monastic strains. I, I, uh, and each one, each kind of order carried its own, its own vibe, its own emphases and priorities. Uh, the, the Benedictines were somewhat unique in that Benedict actually wrote uh, a lot of what he thought. And, and so the, the rule of St. Benedict has sort of come back into vogue now because 
you know, there's this sort of manuscript, there's this, there's this handbook of how to do monastic life, um, you know, rooted in the sixth century. So, uh, what we, so I picked up on the three core principles, which for them would have been vows and, and then five core practices of the Benedictine. So let me just sort of tick them off real quick. They call the vows stability, conversion, and obedience. So in the book, I talk a little bit about what this might have meant in their own context and, and what we might be able to extrapolate out of that. And it would have some meaning in our own modern lives, far from the monastery. And, and, and so I have, have pulled out of those ideas some super core truths. I mean, these have been, these have been life-changing for me. And have really been sewn into my my daily and weekly and and the rhythms of my life. So living in the belovedness of God, <laughs> you know, not just our belief about being loved, but experiencing the love of God on a daily basis. I mean, I don't know any more truing force in life than than living and leading out of that experience of being beloved, being lovable. <laughs> being likable by God, um, that in itself is like mic drop. Let's just go home and meditate on that one for a while. Conversion, I pulled out into living in the abundance of God. And I know that word gets bandied around a bit, and it's, it's, it's far from a prosperity message. It is all about God being the full source of everything that we need, all the things that we don't know that we need, but we do truly deeply need. Every felt need tags down into God as source. Big idea number three, um, surrendering our lives, surrendering our day, surrendering our schedule, surrendering our vision, surrendering our self-identity, surrendering our churches, surrendering our families, our finances, just you name it. It's all about receiving what's being given by God instead of trying to accomplish great things for God. So I'll just tease that and let that hang and then tick off the five core practices of the Benedictines, which was prayer, obvious, study, maybe not so obvious, but works and work it being the third. So they really saw work as a spiritual practice, yeah. which I think is a beautiful way that really brings together the sense of uh, what we would call vocation. Def we are definitely relevant to our bivocational church planners. 90% of church planners are bivocational. So for us on this show, man, you're, you're, you're speaking our love language big time. Yeah. And, and hopefully it kind of guards against thinking, well, the, the church work we do is, is the sacred part. And the other part is just what we do to get a paycheck so we can do the church part. That's not how we think about around here. You know, we, uh, no, we're, 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 uh, we see it as all being sacred. We don't see yeah. that false divide. And I think that's where the Benedictines were at. Um, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. Brad, Brad Briscoe's done amazing amounts of work on this. Do you know, Brad? Right I don't. Model. Sounds like a guy I need to know about. Yeah, you should. You should know. He's written a book called Bivocational that um, is really good. It's theologically, I think, significant. The work that he's done. He's he's really compiled and collated. So many people have been talking about this. Like you said, the Benedictines going back. I mean, this is nothing new under the sun. But I think it's getting rediscovered. That oh, these guys are already onto this. Like hundreds <laughs> of years ago. How come we're just coming into this? Like we discovered it. You know. <laughs> Well, I love what you said at the very beginning. You just made passing comment to the fact that folks listening to this podcast are, they're surrounded by folks that are not necessarily Christians. And how powerful is that? I mean, boy, the, the, the moment you step into being a full-time pastor, I, I'm singing to the choir here, <laughs> you know, boom, into the bubble and uh, lose so much of our connection with the, the, the real angst and struggle and and challenge mm. of living in the world. I'll, I'll say this, Jerome. Um, on, on our podcast, we goof around. We don't take ourselves very seriously. We actually take our audience seriously. And Pete and I have said this before, that on this podcast, we're not trying to be the hero. We literally feel the guys in the trenches out there. Those are the heroes. Our listeners are the heroes of this oh, podcast, yeah. like your dad, who yeah. 
I mean, just I mean, I'm I'm a hero too, <laughs> but <laughs> but outside of that, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, me too. And Jerome definitely feels he's a hero. I mean, we're all heroes, you know, and and whatnot. Sorry, Jerome, we're we're messing up your flow, but the fact you're so cool about this shows our 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 people are gonna like you. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind. <laughs> well, before you threw off my flow. I was talking about prayer, study, That's what we do, work, yes, hospitality. It's kind of an interesting one to include in a set of spiritual practices. Uh, but you know, the Benedictines really honed this to perfection, and 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 even today, if you show up, uh, you might have to call before you show up. But Benedictine monasteries will will let you come and stay, and they will put you up and feed you without cost. I mean, they really take seriously the idea that we are entertaining angels. We are, in, we are inviting Christ embodied into our community. And I think that is, is a really powerful force that bears some attention. And the final uh, practice that I discuss in the book is the practice of renewal. And, and that really kind of hints at, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about um, paying attention to our lives and then adding time into our lives. Time being that, you know, most, most difficult uh, of resources to really seemingly be able to carry all the responsibilities we carry, right? Uh, every one of us, before you even get to being bivocational. And that just multiplies the challenge. But, but so it is, especially in that world, it is, Kind of, it is definitely swimming upstream to say, I'm going to take an hour or two in the morning just to connect my soul and God. I'm going to actually take a Sabbath without, you know, that talk about ancient wisdom, <laughs> Sabbath. Wow. Cra- crazy concept and, uh, and, and utterly restorative. It, one of my last interviews, the guy asked me if there was just one practice you could encourage someone to take. And I hadn't, I had that question before and I hadn't even thought about it before, but the answer was immediate practicing the Sabbath. And, and so that really discovering the gift of Sabbath as not restriction, but, but true gift that can be a game changer. The, the need for our bodies, souls, minds to be restored instead of just always operating on overload and overdrive is phenomenal. And then from there, we can begin to talk about other rhythms that can be healthy. I, I encourage spiritual leaders to take a, a day a month and a week and a quarter and a week, a year as, as rhythms of healthy leadership, not for vacation, but purely for engagement of getting our souls restored by God and attending to God. That's really good. Well, um, my Author today, our guest has been uh, Jerome Daly. The book has been Gravitas, The Monastic Rhythms of Healthy Leadership. Jerome, we want to thank you for coming on. Is there anywhere where people can uh, join in and uh, maybe engage you deeper on this level? Is there a website or somewhere they can go? Yeah, thanks, man. Um, Thrive9solutions.com is uh, the place where I do my executive coaching and there's a specific page on all sorts of spiritual resources and points of reference specifically from the book itself. So I would, I would welcome folks to come and take a look. Lots of free downloads, uh, things that we talk about in the book, like Lexio Divina and centering prayer, the daily exam. And, you know, uh, all of these are, I mean, they're available all, all over the place, but if you want a central collection, some of the ways that I think about them, feel free to come take a look. Jerome, one of the things that we always like to do when we have a, a quality guest, it's only done with quality guests like you. Quality victims. We have one final question that we like to ask. Jerome, if you were to get into a physical fist fight with St. Francis of Assisi, who would win? <laughs> Seriously, that's the question you yeah, asked? Well, yeah, well, yeah. Obviously, the, 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 the opponent... You know, the contender changes every time depending on our guest. Oh, okay, okay. And it was either Pete Scazzaro 
or a famous monk in history. And we went to St. Francis and, and you can, you can't say, well, he was a pacifist and became a lover, not a fighter. We're like, Hey, before he was fully sanctified, when he was like coming out of a soldier life, going into monkdom, like before he was like, Oh no, I don't fight well, that in between phase. You got to take him in who would win in a physical. Oh history? man. Francis would kick my ass. It would be a no contest. <laughs> Uh, I mean, <laughs> especially, you know, I mean, the animals came and ate. A, he would have all sorts of uh, assistance, but he wouldn't need it because, he, like you say, he had a he had a serious past. I would no, be no, I, in no offense, but I think he would take me easily as well. Like I'm, my money was totally on Francis. He would take Pete and I probably together. No, you know, no, let's, let's he would dude hand to hand combat. That dude, that dude was like bashing people with his armored gauntlet. Superman, <laughs> uh, Deftones. That's that's all I got. So, you know, hey, Jerome, you have been a, an awesome guest today. We apologize to you for coming on here, and thank you at the same time. So, uh, it's been really good, guys. The book again is Gravitas: The Monastic Rhythms of Healthy Leadership. Um, healthy leadership is super important. We know this, guys. I I could not think of a better time for this subject to come across our radar than in COVID nineteen, where everybody's saying. This is the one thing they don't have. Everybody's frenzied and frenetic, you know, harassed and harried. Nobody right now seems to have time to cultivate gravitas in their life. And I love the fact that gravitas is the way that um, it's put is it's just kind of, he didn't even put it out there or something like, you got to have this. It's just, this is a result of other things. And, and, and I think if you buy the book thinking, I need Gravitas, and I'm going to get this as a guidebook to get it, you're totally doing it wrong, man. But if you look at it and go, you know, it's about Jesus, which is what Jerome originally was saying is, hey, it's, it's just about spending time with him, then you're on the right track. This would be a great book for you. Pick it up. You can get it on Amazon um, and uh, also check Thrive 9 Dot com. So, uh, Pete, while you're spending all this time, and we apologize for our leading because they're always like this too. And, and beat meditation, yes. And when you're cultivating gravitas in your life, obviously you don't have time to do all your finances and your church budgeting, Pete. Where, where do you go for that? I'm so glad you asked, Pete, because I actually turned to simplifychurch.com. They help what? me with all my IRS compliance, my payroll taxes, my everything. Uh, website development. I think they even help out with assistance now and then. So, I mean, that's that's really who I reach out to. Well, who is that? I've never heard of that before Simplify. after seven years of this podcast. Who is that? Simplifychurch.com. Just ask for Josh. Josh and Peyton and Pete sent you? That's it. Something like that? Okay, cool. That works for me, and I'm sure it works for Simplified Church. They stopped listening a long time ago. So, hey, guys, thanks for joining us today. This has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell reminding you, if you want to reach the ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. 